بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, so today إن شاء الله تعالى we will finish uh, one one incident of surah of, of uh, incident of Tabuk and then I will go over uh, most of Surah At-Tawbah as we had said uh, so that insha'Allah ta'ala we will have an understanding of the verses that were revealed at the battle of Tabuk so there's one incident left that happened after the return of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and that is the death of the leader of the Munafiqoon Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul that uh, probably within a month after the return of the Prophet وسلم, Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul, he fell sick and they realized that he was going to die and he requested the Prophet وسلم, to uh, visit him on his deathbed. Now, who is Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul? Let us quickly remind ourselves, who is Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul? He was going to be, not the king, they didn't have a king. He was going to be one of the main leaders of Medina, of Yathrib pre-Islam, and he was the senior most uh, politician who was alive when the Prophet emigrated to Yathrib, to Medina. And the other politicians, the other elders had either been killed in the Bu'ath wars, or after the coming of the Prophet within the year or two they fled. And so eventually the only senior leader, and he would have been in his 70s, he would have been an elderly person, the only senior leader left is Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And when did he embrace Islam? Remind me. When did he embrace Islam? At Aqaba? Was he present at Aqaba? Obviously not. No. When did he embrace Islam? Why? After Badr was when the final idolaters had to either leave or embrace Islam. And he was the last batch of people to convert. That after the victory of Badr, you really had no choice. That you either accepted Islam or you left. Paganism was eliminated from Medina after Badr. So he accepted Islam with the last batch of converts. Yani as they say, Rahm Anfi. He didn't want to. He was forced to accept Islam. And he first showed us his true colors in the battle of Uhud. That's when the first incident occurred that really demonstrated that he's not actually serious about his Islam because what happened that he turned back with one third of the army with 300 of the, his followers. He turned back and he abandoned uh, the Prophet with what excuse? What did he say? What was his excuse at Uhud? So he criticized the Prophet for not listening to him. Like, you guys didn't listen to me, why should I fight with you, right? So he really felt himself to be the leader, astaghfirullah, above the process. I mean, this is kufr in and of itself to feel that. He felt, I am the person, you should have listened to me. And so you didn't listen to me, why should I listen to you, basically? And he then returned back uh, with one third of the army. And what did he do in Ahzab? In the battle of Ahzab, the Khandaq, what did he do? Mm, not that explicit. He didn't actually plot with the Yahud. With the Quraysh, maybe. If not with them, with them. <laughs> it's got to be one of the two. <laughs> no, he didn't actually. If he did, this would have been blatant treason. And he would have been executed. That would have been blatant treason. What did he do? Who can remind me? We, we did. That's, see, that's why I do tafsir. That's exactly why. I pause and I do the Qur'an because I want you to be re related to the Qur'an. It's in the Qur'an. Surah Al-Ahzab, I shouldn't even told you, but it's obvious. Surah Al-Ahzab is Khandaq. Surah Al-Ahzab, right? الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسُ إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ فَخْشَوْهُمْ He tried to terrify the Muslims. Or he himself was terrified. Let's put it that way. He himself was terrified. He was genuinely fearful for his life. And he wanted somehow to get out, to make some type of treaty, you know, to, to concede anything away as long as they would let him stay alive. So he would go around the Sahaba and keep on telling them, can't you see the whole of mankind is here? Aren't you terrified? Aren't you scared? And so he actually went around making the Sahaba or trying to make the Sahaba scared. And what did Allah say in the Quran? What did the Sahaba do when they... 
فَزَادَهُمْ إِيمَانَ The Iman went up, right? So here we find again a true coward that he's terrified at the, uh, at the, the, the people gathered around. Had he actually cooperated with the Banu Quraidah uh, or with the, the Quraysh, then this is clear treason. And that would not have been tolerated. So he's on the limits. That's why he's a munafiq. That his kufr is inside, not outside. His kufr is inside. And then what else did he do after this, the big incident? The slander of Aisha. But right before the slander, in the incident of Quraida, no, sorry, not Quraida, Banu Mustaliq. Okay, but then on the way back, what did he do? Again, this is in the Quran. And again, we did this. SubhanAllah. Guys, <laughs> should I have an exam at the end? Should I have an exam and any comprehensive of the whole seerah? Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Again, this is in the Quran, explicit in the Quran. On the return, what did Abdullah ibn Ubay do? Sisters, I hear some mumbling. Anybody? No, this was that was also related. The 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 if is if. We're going to get to that. يَقُولُونَ لَإِن رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ ال أَعَزُّ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلْ Right? Surah Al-Munafiqoon. Yes, now you know, mashallah. Yes. <laughs> Where were you two minutes ago? <laughs> it's called Surah Al-Munafiqoon. It's called the Surah of the Hypocrites. And one of the worst things that he did was that he publicly said in a derogatory manner uh, that when we return back to Medina, the people of honor will expel the people of uh, unholy or the lowly people. And he meant himself with the a'az and he meant astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, the process by saying adhal. And this type of mockery is clear, blatant kufr, right? And what happened quickly, this is a refresher, I'm trying to, what happened when they returned back? His son, whose name was? His son, whose name was? Zayd wal Amr wal <laughs> if it's not Zayd, it's Amr. Zayd wal Amr. What's the third most common name then? <laughs> Abdullah, exactly. Yalla, see? Okay, he got it. Zayd, Amr, Abdullah. Khalas, okay. It's Abdullah, yes. Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Right? He, he was a true Muslim. Abdullah ibn Abdullah was a genuine Muslim. And when he heard that his father had said this, so he did not allow his own father to enter back into the city. Until he said, you ask forgiveness and the process explicitly allows you to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to go inside. And on more than one occasion, Umar ibn al-Khattab had asked permission to execute Abdullah ibn Ubay. More than one occasion. And the Prophet ﷺ kept on saying, let him be. On sometimes he would say, Allah did not ask me to open up the hearts of men. Sometimes he would say, let not others say that. I am killing my own followers. So there's a PR move as well that his Islam, his pretending to be Muslim is less harmful than his execution. Right? So executing will bring about more uh, harm. And so all of these incidents uh, took place. And uh, he was also the one who began the slander of Aisha, which is also one of his worst, if not his worst uh, crime in his entire life and Allah explicitly again mentions him well not explicitly by name but I mean you know it's understood Allah explicitly hints at him let's say uh, in Surat Al the slander of Aisha come on guys huh Surat Al Nur see this do you understand why I'm doing the, the Quran with you guys huh even though I don't know why I should just skip over <laughs> we did this Wallahi we did this I remember clearly we went over the whole ayah by ayah Surat Al Nur Surat Al Nur Right? And Allah Azza wa says, وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّا كِبْرَهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ This is Abdullah ibn Ubay. وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّا كِبْرَهُ This is a very harsh word. There is no English translation. تَوَلَّا كِبْرَهُ The one who took charge, the most arrogant of them. He was the one, maybe we'll say in English, the ringleader. Like it's a derogatory term. The ringleader amongst them. وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّا كِبْرَهُ مِنْهُمْ And this is Abdullah ibn Ubayy ibn Salul. The one who began the plot, hatched the plot, and astaghfirullah verbalized it the first. But there was no witnesses who would testify against him. And so he was not punished in this world. And Allah said, don't worry, I'll punish him in the next. 
لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Well, I'll take care of him. You don't even have to take care of him. So this is Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn uh, Salul. And his whole CV, his whole history is nothing but one evil after another and one slander after another. And uh, when he was on his deathbed, he begged the Prophet ﷺ to visit him. And here is where really, wallahi, it is amazing the psychology of the munafiqun that as we'll talk about even today, and most of today's talk in Surah At-Tawbah will be about the munafiqun. At some level, they believed in Allah. And at another level, they're too arrogant to worship him. And in this, they have some type of similarity with Iblis. Which is why the munafiqun are worse than a regular non-Muslim kafir. That the regular kafir doesn't know Allah, he doesn't know Islam, and in fact, a totally ignorant kafir might even be forgiven on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. But the munafiq knows Islam at some level, as we'll even see now, that why is he wanting the Prophet to come visit him? When he's about to die, why is he even wanting the Prophet to come visit him? He in fact says to him, uh, when, when the visit comes, is that, and he asks forgiveness for me. Seek istighfar for me, right? At some level, there is knowledge and recognition that Allah is my creator. And yet at another level, he's too arrogant to actually genuinely submit to Allah and his messenger. And this is why Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ That the munafiqeen will occupy the lowest depths of the fire of hell. So when the, the call came to visit, uh, Umar ibn Khattab said, Ya Rasulullah, will you visit him when he's an enemy of Allah, when he is adu Allah? And so the Prophet ﷺ said, I hope that through him, Allah will cause a thousand of his people to embrace Islam. Now, a thousand here is not meant literally. It's just an expression because there were not a thousand followers of Abdullah ibn Ubay. Abdullah ibn Ubay did not have 1,000 people under him. It's just simply an expression that by visiting him and showing him some kindness, I hope to get the hearts of those who look up to him and whose iman is still weak. And this shows us again that Yes, Islam does take into account the overall image or having a positive PR campaign or inviting people that you might even disagree with for a greater good. The Prophet did not defend Abdullah ibn Ubay. When Umar ibn al-Khattab said, how can you visit him when he's adu Allah? He didn't say, no, he's not adu Allah. No, he's a nice guy. He didn't say that. Rather, he said, I hope by this visit to get the hearts of a thousand men, meaning there's a greater good to visit. And this shows us over and over again that in these types of situations, you weigh the good and the bad, masalih and mafasid. And you look at what is better overall for the uh, ummah. And so the Prophet ended up uh, visiting him. And there are two reports, perhaps both can be true, but Allah knows best. The one report says that he himself asked the Prophet for his shirt to use as a kafan. And the more authentic report is that after he died, his son Abdullah ibn Abdullah, his son Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay asked the Prophet for his shirt. So there are both reports found. And it could be both valid as well in that when he was alive he asked, and then when he died, Abdullah ibn Abdullah then kind of asked him for the actual shirt. Allah knows best, but there are both reports found. Did both of them happen or did one of them happen? In any case, what is clear beyond a shadow of a doubt, the Prophet gave his own shirt. Like one of his shirts, he basically gave it. And this goes back to my talk yesterday. If you remember, those of you who attended yesterday's talk, we talked about, what we talked about yesterday? Tabarruk, baraka, right? And this is exactly an example of tabarruk. That the Prophet gave his own uh, shirt. Then Abdullah ibn Abdullah asked the Prophet to lead janazah for him to lead janazah for him. And so the body was brought to the masjid and Umar ibn al-Khattab, when the Prophet stood up, Umar ibn al-Khattab held on to his lower garment and he said, Ya Rasulullah, will you pray for him after he has done such and such and then such and such and then such and, and he began listing some of what I have listed. Will you make dua for him after he did this and he did this and he did this and a whole long CV is done. And then Umar said, and even after Allah has prohibited you from praying for them, isn't it haram to pray for the munafiqun? And this shows us the level of comfort that Umar ibn Khattab felt with the Prophet ﷺ for him to actually remind him of a verse of the Quran. That Ya Rasulullah, isn't it haram to do this, right? And this also shows us not, I don't want to say freedom of speech because that has a different concept, but it clearly shows us that the leader 
can be politely challenged. And even if that leader is Rasulullah that Umar ibn Khattab is saying, I don't understand, how can you pray for him? So, didn't he do this, didn't he do this, didn't he do this? And didn't Allah say not to pray for the munafiqun? And compare and contrast this to some of our leaders that, Wallah, if you were to criticize even one one hundredth of anything, you will not be seen walking on the street after that anymore. All right, and we see this in many countries of our times, but let's not get political right now. The point being that Umar ibn Khattab asked, how can you ask for forgiveness when Allah has said that uh, you should not pray for the uh, hypocrites? And the Prophet wasallam said, rather Allah has given me a choice and I have chosen to ask. And then he quoted the verse, استغفر لهم أو لا تستغفر لهم إن تستغفر لهم سبعين مرة فلن يغفر الله لهم. So this is Surah At-Tawbah verse 80. And this shows us that when this incident happened, much of Surah Tawbah had been revealed. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Surah Tawbah verse 80. And in it Allah says, استغفر لهم أو لا تستغفر لهم. Seek forgiveness or don't seek forgiveness. And this is what is the reference when the Prophet said, Allah has given me the choice. خيرني Rabbi. I have the choice, which of the two? Should I ask forgiveness? Should I not ask for forgiveness? Then Allah says, if you were to ask 70 times, Allah will not forgive. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, if I knew that 71 times would have forgiven them, I will ask 71 times. So what he derived from the verse, our Prophet ﷺ, is that Allah is not telling him, don't ask for forgiveness. Allah is saying that I'm not going to forgive even if you ask me 70 times. But Allah didn't say don't ask. So he said to Umar ibn al-Khattab, Allah did not prohibit me. Allah gave me the choice. Istaghfir aw la tastaghfir. Then they, he prayed, they accompanied him to the grave. And in a tabari it is even mentioned that he went into the grave himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he helped bury this man who was such an enemy. And this shows us, if anything, it shows us that you do not want the fire of hell even for your worst, worst, worst enemy. That it is such, and the Prophet did not have any, as we say, lost love with this man. He did not like him at all. And in his entire life, Abdullah ibn Ubayd did nothing but irritate Rasulullah But now that he's dead, you do not want the fire of hell for even this type of person. And he outwardly died professing Islam. So his case is not like the case of those who outwardly die, like Abu Jahl, knowing Islam and having rejected it. There is no, you have clearly rejected. And so the Prophet ﷺ's tenderness, his rahmah, his mercy was so much that he even wanted Abdullah ibn Ubay possibly to be forgiven. And then after this incident, Allah revealed what is now Surah Tawbah verse 84. Remember, the verse numberings came afterwards. Remember, when the verse came down, it didn't have a number on it. And the Prophet put it where it's supposed to be put. So it is now Surah Tawbah verse 84, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَا تَأَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهِ Never pray for any of them who dies. And never stand at their grave. Why? Because he stood at the grave of Abdullah ibn Ubayy. And he made dua for him, as was his custom, to make a long dua for the deceased. So after he did it for Abdullah ibn Ubay, then Allah Azza wa Jal said that if a known munafiq dies, now this no longer applies to us because we don't know any munafiq for sure. By its nature, nifaq is hidden. That's why it's called nifaq. So for us, this verse is not applicable that an outward Muslim dies and we knew him to be publicly saying he's a Muslim, then we assume him to be a Muslim. Right? But for the Prophet ﷺ, and Jibreel had told him the names of the hypocrites as we know, right? that the Jibreel had told him these are the names of the main hypocrites, we should say, in Medina. He knew their names. So after this, the Prophet ﷺ was told, never ever pray for these people. And never stand at their graves. They are kuffar. You treat them like kuffar. 
They are kuffar because and Allah told them who they are by name. We, as I said, cannot apply this verse that if you thought somebody's dubious or whatnot, well, that's between him and Allah. If outwardly he's a Muslim, we judge him as Islam, we pray janazah for him, and we bury him in the graveyard of the uh, Muslim. So uh, with this incident, we finalize, we conclude all of the uh, incidents of Tabuk, and now we begin uh, talking a little bit about uh, Surah Tatawbah, and I will try my best to do as many verses as possible, but the fact of the matter is that two-thirds of the Surah deals with the Battle of Tabuk, and so uh, probably we cannot do each and every su uh, verse. Um, uh, and also realize that the first uh, 37 verses were revealed in a few months. And we're going to come to them later on. The beginning portion of Surah Tatoba was not revealed right now. These portions were revealed uh, in uh, Dhul uh, Qa'da, excuse me, and the beginning of Dhul Hijjah, of the ninth year. And the rest of the Surah was revealed uh, basically a month before uh, the Hajj season. So, now, I, I think we all know that the Qur'an is not arranged chronologically. I think we all know this, right? That the first verse revealed is actually Iqra, which is at the end of the Qur'an. And Surah Baqarah was revealed around the time of Badr and before Badr and is the first of the Qur'an. So it's not arranged chronologically. And ayat would come down and the Prophet would tell the scribes, put this ayah here, put that ayah there, and that's how the Qur'an was compiled. So, as we read the Surah, realize that the first third of the Surah was not revealed at this point in time, it was revealed maybe in a month. So, where do we begin? And firstly, uh, very quickly, Surah at uh is of course the only Surah in the Quran that does not have the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It's the only Surah in the Quran. And what is, and it is, it is also one of the last surahs to be revealed. It is also one of the last revelations of the Quran because we're already in the ninth year of the Hijrah. We are already in the ninth year of the Hijrah. There is literally one year left of the Prophet's life, and then that is it. Uh, he will uh, وسلم, move on to the next life. So, this is one of the last surahs to be revealed. Now, why is there no Basmala in Surah At Tawbah? There are two opinions narrated from the Sahaba, uh, and the first of them is a hadith in Sunan at Tirmidhi that Uthman ibn Affan, the compiler of the Mus'haf, was asked that. O Khalifa, O, o, o Amir al muminin why did you not write the Basmala in Surah at tawbah Or why did you put Surah at tawbah uh, after Anfal? Why did you put it in its place when Anfal is Makki and Tawbah is Madani? When Anfal is, sorry, not Makki, Anfal is early Medina and Tawbah is late Medina. Sorry, take that back. Anfal is, was revealed at Badr and a tawbah was revealed at Tabuk, and between them is the whole Madani era, right? So Uthman was asked, why did you place a tawbah along with Anfal when the two revelations took place so far apart? So Uthman ibn Affan said that tawbah was one of the last surahs revealed, and the matter was unclear to us. Where should it go? And therefore, we put it with Anfal because the content is the same. Qital and Harb and Jihad is the same. Anfal and Tawbah is primarily about Qital. And we did not put a Basmala, not knowing if the two are connected or not, basically. So this raises a whole bunch of questions. And because of this, and as you know by now, this is an advanced class, so we say things that Sometimes will confuse you, but that's part of advanced knowledge that you learn things that are uh, not known before. Because of this, some of the tabi'un actually said that Tawbah and Anfal are one surah. And that's why there's no basmala between them. Now remember the Sahaba did not write the names of the surahs inside the Mus'haf. And they did not write the ayah numbers inside the Mus'haf, all of this was came after a hundred years, two hundred years. So the Sahaba did not write the names of the surah. They would simply write Bismillah rahman rahim and you'd know there's a new surah. And they wouldn't write ayah number one, ayah number two, this came later on. And therefore, some of the tabi'un understood from this that Tawbah and Anfal are in fact one surah. So there are reports from the earliest of the times that 
there are 113 surahs in the Quran. Not because they said the surah is missing, but they said two becomes one. And Fal and Tawbah becomes one surah. And this was reported by Qatada, the student of Ibn Abbas and other of the Tabi'un. But this is a, a position that hardly anybody else agreed with. And the bulk of the Ummah, and this is what has later become, we should say, Ijma' because there is no difference of opinion on this issue now, that Anfal and Tawbah are two different uh, surahs. And uh, this also raises the question of who did the ordering of the surahs. And I've talked about this a number of times in various lectures. From this hadith, it appears that the Sahaba were the one who ordered the surahs. Now, there's ordering of the chapters and there's ordering of the surahs. Sorry, there's ordering of the verses and there's ordering of the surahs. The ordering of the verses, everybody agrees the Prophet did that. And in fact, you even just read the surah and you know that the ordering is clearly an internal thing. You read any surah, then you find there is some type of flow, even if the flow is not demonstrated in English. But there is a flow. There's a rhythm, there's a style, and every hafiz knows this, that there's something that just connects from one verse to the next. And by the way, oh, just to pause here, I'm going into a whole different than this is the rest of the today is not seerah by the way, it's the seer mainly, but it's linked to the seerah. So there's a very famous uh, German Orientalist in our times alive. Her name is Angelica Neuwirth. Angelica Neuwirth. And in fact, she was uh, awarded an honorary PhD uh, from Yale the same year that I was awarded mine. So she was at the ceremony being awarded the honorary PhD. Now she of course has a PhD. She's an elderly lady. She spent her entire life her speciality is the Qur'an. She's obviously not a Muslim. Her speciality is the Qur'an and the nazm of the Qur'an or the harmony and the structure of the Qur'an. And she has written many books. You will find some of them on Amazon. Angelica Neuwirth in English and much of work is in German. And she actually has some very unique and advanced types of research done where she looks at the consonants and the she calls the melodies and rhymes. We would not approve of that. But she has her way of looking at it where she has analyzed Surah Qaf and other surahs, and she's actually shown there's an internal structure that parallels. So there's a rhythm going through each surah. And uh, just as a side point, so one day she came to Yale in our class. We have a class when I was a student, not when I was a word of the when I was a student. She came, and um, one of my professors is very anti this. He believes ideas that are not very good at all about the Quran, that he, it was compiled later on and it wasn't in its original form. And so he was saying that. Uh, it's clear that later scribes changed sections here and there. That was his position. And Angelica, and they're both non-Muslims, said, no, that's clearly false because then she went into her advanced studies of, look at this, you know, it rhymes with this and this goes there. And, and she's proving now there's an internal harmony within each surah that clearly demonstrates that whoever the author was, now she does not believe the Quran to be divine, but she does believe the Quran has been preserved from the Prophet's time. And she believes that the process, and I mean, this is the way they think that he was some type of genius to put the Quran together. That's what they believe. But what is interesting is that in her analysis, she actually finds a synthesis between the surahs. And she defends this very passionately. And I saw this debate as a student between uh, the two of them. So the point being that uh, the arrangement of the verses are clearly from the Prophet, yani from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nobody denies that. But then the arrangement of the surahs is something that there's always been a controversy over. And Allah knows best, but it does appear that it was the Sahaba who simply decided to have the surahs arranged in this manner. Uh, Surah Fatiha, Baqarah, uh, Al Imran, Nisa, Ma'ida, uh, and Amin Fa'adah, all the way through, that they felt that they had their reason for doing it. And the evidence for this, for this is that every Sahabi who had his own Quran had his own arrangement of the surahs as well. So the arrangement of the surahs was not something that was fully standardized. But once the Sahaba have standardized it in the time of Uthman, then it became binding on us to follow it as well. Is that clear? Right, that the Sahaba then standardized it. So, if anybody wants to print a Mus'haf, he is obliged to follow these surahs in the order in order to respect the ijma' of Uthman's compilation. But it was not as if 
the Prophet ﷺ ordered the arrangement of the surahs. And this hadith seems to indicate that as well, that Uthman said that, you know, we didn't know, uh, you know, where it should be placed. And so the content was the same. So we simply uh, put those two together. Now, this is one opinion why there's no basmala. There's another opinion as well. And that is narrated from Ali ibn Abi Talib. That he was asked uh, by, uh, by one of his sons, I think it was, I forgot now the, the narrator, that why don't we have the basmala in Surah Tawbah? And so he said, this is a surah where Allah cuts off his ties from the pagans. It is not befitting he begins it with his rahmah. It's not befitting that he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, bara'atum min Allah. Bara'a means I have nothing to do with you. Cut off. All cut off time. So it's not befitting. And then the rest of the surah is uh, very harsh against those who reject Allah and His Messenger. So it is not befitting that it begins with Rahmah. So both of these opinions have a sense of legitimacy to them. Now, as we said, the first 37 verses were revealed right before the Hajj. And in fact, we'll come to them in a while. Maybe even the ne not next one, but maybe in two, three lessons, we'll come to these verses. But now let's move from verse 38. That verse 38 to the end of the surah basically is what was revealed for the battle of uh, Tabuk. So all of this has to do with the battle of Tabuk. And so we begin, and I'll just quickly go over as many verses as I can and link them to the stories that we have done and also to contextualize these verses that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya amanu, ma lakum idha qila lakum fi ila al -ard. O you who believe, what is the matter with you? That when you are told to go forth in the way of Allah, you find yourself being drawn to the earth. You find yourself slumping down to the ground. Are you satisfied with the life of this world over the Akhirah? So here begins the severe warning and it will be repeated throughout. I'm telling you to go forth. Your command is to go. What is the matter with you? Now that I'm telling you to go, your bodies are being dragged to the ground. And by the way, these verses are very powerful verses of jihad and we need to put them into context. Unfortunately, we do have some groups out there. They take these verses and they apply them to situations that Allah did not reveal them for. And, uh, and of course, here I refer to uh, the extremist groups out there. These verses are valid, but it is un-Islamic for any Muslim to take this verse and apply it to his particular cause and say, Allah is referring to my cause. Allah is referring to the battle of Tabuk. And yes, every legitimate cause has a share of this verse. Nobody's denying that. But to claim that this verse applies to my particular group and our particular expedition, you are saying that Allah is as if revealing His verse to you and this is very dangerous and this is what leads to extremism. To take this verse and then apply it to uh, oneself. And Allah says, if you do not go forth illa tanfiru, you will be punished a severe punishment and Allah will replace you with a different people and you will not harm Allah at all and Allah is uh, capable of all things. So here we have, Allah, here we have in my humble opinion, a very explicit reference that the battle of Tabuk was simply a command and a test from Allah. Remember, we go back to the first lesson. Why did the battle of Tabuk take place? And we cannot find a legitimate logical excuse. Nothing actually seemed to have happened of substance really when you got there. So what was the purpose then? It's very clear from these verses, the purpose was a test. And that test was to raise the bar so that after uh, the death of the Prophet the Sahaba would continue doing uh, the jihad to other nations as they did. <inaudible> if you will not help him, O Muslims, then remember Allah has already helped him. Allah doesn't need you. There was a time when there was none of you. There was a time when none of you could have helped him. And Allah Azza wa was the one who helped him. When the people who disbelieved expelled him, and he was only two people, him and another person, Thani Athnaini, in Huma Fil Ghar, when the both of them were in the cave, when he said to his companion, Don't worry, Allah is with us. So Allah is referencing the Hijrah. Why? Because now at Tabuk, the quantity of Muslims is more than has ever been. And Allah is saying, do you think I need you? When there was no Muslims to help, when there was nobody and he was alone, except for his companion and friend, I had already helped him. If you're not going to help him, I will help him. He was the second of two, and this is an Arabic expression, the second of two does not mean astaghfirullah that 
there, there's a hierarchy. It simply means there were two people, he, he was one of them. In English we say he was one of two. In Arabic you say the second of two, the third of three, and it simply means one out of two people. That's what it means. When he was in the cave, when he said to his companion, do not worry, Allah is with us. So Allah sent down his tranquility and supported him with soldiers you do not see. And we talked about the stories of what happened and some of the ulama say these soldiers were the pigeon and the, the spider web and others say these were the angels who diverted away the, the, the pagans and all of these stories are, have a uh, sense of legitimacy to them. And by the way, this is the verse that explicitly affirms Abu Bakr is a sahabi. إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ And there's no other verse that specifically calls a person sahib other than Abu Bakr. So anybody who denies Abu Bakr is a Sahabi has contradicted the Qur'an. And anybody who contradicts the Qur'an is not a believer in the Qur'an. And that we are very clear about this point. Anybody who says Abu Bakr is not a companion of the Prophet he has gone against the testimony of the Qur'an and that is something that we do not uh, consider to be a part of Islam anymore. Infiru khifafan wa thiqala. This is the most powerful verse about Tabuk. Go forth, nafara here, go forth on the way of Allah. Khifafan wa thiqala literally translates as whether you're light or heavy. And the meaning here, whether you're healthy or sick, or I should say sick or healthy. Whether you're poor or rich. Whether you have the means or don't. Go forth, khifafan wa thiqala. Whatever your state might be. And this shows us the battle of Tabuk was fardain. Unlike Badr, that was not Fardain. Unlike many other expeditions, it was voluntary. But the Battle of Tabuk, every able-bodied Muslim had to participate. And once again, to me, this is crystal clear. What is the wisdom? Again, the wisdom is to demonstrate who is the real believer to prepare them for the battles that will take place within a year uh, after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu And strive with your money and with your lives in the way of Allah. That is better for you if you only knew. Had this been a close gain for money, arad is money to gain. Had this been easy money, and a simple journey and travel, they would have followed you. They would have come. But they found it difficult to go so far. And they will swear to Allah, if we had the means, we would come out with you. They're swearing to Allah. We just don't have the capability. And Allah says, even as they swear, they are destroying themselves because Allah knows they are lying. So here begins the uh, tirade the criticism of the munafiqun that Allah says you are lying you swear that you're, you're, you're ready to go but you're not qualified and Allah says you are lying anka lima adhinta lahum. Allah has forgiven you why did you give them permission and this is one of the most beautiful verses in the Quran in that even before Allah says why did you do this Allah says I've already forgiven you anka lima adhinta lahum. and so even and it's a very mild rebuke, very mild criticism that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Allah has forgiven you, but why did you give them permission? Now, what, what is the, the reference here? So remember in the, the beginning, every munafiq would come and give the flimsiest of excuse. And they would just say, oh, uh, I'm not feeling well, my family is this, this, that, whatever is the excuse. And whatever person came with an excuse, our Prophet would accept it. And Allah said, Allah has forgiven you, but why did you accept every excuse? لِمَا أَذِنْتَ لَهُمْ حَتَّى يَتَبَيْنَ لَكَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَتَعْلَمَ الْكَاذِبِينَ You should not have accepted every excuse so that you can tell which of the excuses is legitimate and which of them are liars. Who is telling the truth and who is lying? Then Allah says, those who believe in Allah and the last day will never ask for excuses. The excuses don't come from those who believe in Allah in the last day. And by the way, for those of us who think, oh yeah, so how does this verse apply to me? Think how many excuses we make for what Allah wants us to do. How many excuses we make for any 
commandment, obligation of Allah, whether it's salah, whether it's zakah, how many excuses come? And Allah says, those who genuinely believe in Allah, Allah in the last day, they will not give you an excuse. <inaudible> the only people who ask excuses are those who do not believe in Allah in the last day and whose hearts are full of doubt and they are vacillating in their doubt. If they had wanted to go out, لو أرادوا الخروجة, they would have prepared for it. لأعدوا له عدة. And here the process is being told, look at those who prepared. Look at the fact they give an excuse and they haven't even checked. They haven't even purchased an animal. They haven't even looked at their uh, gardens and seen what can be done. They haven't done anything. So they are not serious about this excuse. And then Allah says, بِعَاثَهُمْ Allah Himself did not want their presence in your ranks. Allah did not want them to be with you. And so Allah told them to stay behind. وَقِيلَ قُعُدُوا مَعَ الْقَاعِدِينَ uh, Stay back with those who are staying back. And then Allah says, Had they gone forth with you, لَوْ خَرَجُوا فِيكُمْ مَا زَادُوكُمْ إِلَّا خَبَالًا They would have only confused you even more. And they would have spread through your ranks, causing discord. And some of you listen to that discord. Now this is a very powerful verse because in it Allah is saying there's two types of people, actually there's three types of people. The first, the fitna mongers. The second, those who are not fitna mongers but whose hearts will be swayed by the fitna mongers. And then the third, those who will not be swayed by the fitna mongers. And this shows us that there are people of weak hearts. Now here's a point, and I've said this many times, but now you should know this. When we think of the Sahaba, we think of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Talha and whatnot. And yes, that is elite. But let us not forget, for every one Sahabi whose name we know, at least 10,000 his name we do not know. For every one Sahabi whose battles have been recorded, at least 1,000, we don't know anything about them. Not even their names. And so... And, and the reason we don't know their names is because they haven't reached the level of Abu Bakr and Umar. So if even in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were people who could be persuaded to do evil by evil mongers, then what do you think of our times? What do you think of our times? When somebody comes with bad ideas, bad thoughts, there are those who they will not think of those ideas. But when they are spread and told, their hearts will be Sway. So Allah says, وَفِيكُمْ سَمَّعُونَ لَهُمْ There are those in your midst, they will listen to such talk. So Allah did not want them to listen. So Allah saved them by not having the hypocrites in your uh, ranks. Uh, and indeed, they have already desired fitna from before. لَقَدْ إِبْتَغُوا الْفِتْنَةَ مِنْ قَبْلُ Meaning, they have already done plenty of things in the past. But Uhud and Ahzab and Banil Mustaliq, they've already done this. وَقَلَّبُوا لَكَ الْأُمُورِ And they've already upset matters for you before. And all of this is a reference to the previous things that they have done. حَتَّى جَاءَ الْحَقُّ Despite all of their attempts, the truth has still come. And the matter of Allah has become uh, manifest and clear and victorious. Then we have verse number 49. There are those who say, excuse me and let me stay at home and do not put me in a state of fitna. What is the reference here? I can't hear. Yellow women. <laughs> not yellow women. Yes, Ban al-Asfar translates as yellow. We would say white women. That's what it means. Yellow for them means white. They're saying the, 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 the Roman women are too much of a trial, t temptation for me. If I see them, I'll go crazy basically. Right? The most flimsiest of excuse. You're fighting you know, jihad on the battlefield, right? And if you see a woman a hundred miles or whatever miles away, and that's going to like drive you. But this was the excuse he gave, you know, one of the hypocrites, right? This was the excuse he gave. He goes, I can't see those women. Just allow me to stay at home and don't go there. And this is what Allah is referencing, mocking them. This is mocking them, right? Verily, they have fallen into fitna with the excuse of not wanting to see the fitna. They have fallen into the fitna and indeed Jahannam will be able to encompass all of the disbelievers. If good happens to you, it hurts them. They're so stingy and miserly. If you are blessed, it hurts them.
And if a disaster hits you, they will be the first to say, oh, if you had listened to us, for example, if, we, you know, if, if things had gone the other way, that in other words, if a disaster befalls you, they will dissociate from you. And they will either say, you should have listened to us, or we have nothing to do with you, and they will not associate with you then. So when good happens, they're angry. When disaster happens, they're happy. What type of iman is this? And this shows us as well, by the way, that if a Muslim is happy when Islam is smeared, when Islam is subjugated, then this Muslim is not a Muslim. This Muslim is not a Muslim. And if a Muslim feels pain when Islam is being smeared and harmed, then this is a sign of iman. And this ayah uh, proves this. Say, uh, this is one of the most powerful, most beautiful verses. We all love this verse that tell them nothing will happen to us except what Allah has already decreed for us. He is our protector and upon him will we put our trust and that is whom the believers put their trust in. Say, what are you waiting for except one of two things will happen to us? One of two victories. What are the two victories? Either actual victory in this world or martyrdom and victory in the next world. So we are winners in every situation and you are losers in both situations. Uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says uh, that whether you give willingly or unwillingly, Allah will not accept it from you because you are an evil uh, nation. Uh, and then we move on to 56. They swear by Allah they are with you. Their hearts are with you. They are one ummah. But Allah is saying they are not with you and they are full of terror. If they could only escape from the battlefield, if they could find refuge in a cave, if they could cover themselves up, that, that is what they would do. And they would not fight an army openly. And Allah says this as well in the other surah as well, uh, in surah uh, Al-Hashr as well, that Allah Azza wa Jalla says that they, they don't have, they don't have the, the courage to fight on the battlefield. And there are those amongst them who criticize you concerning charity. If they are given, they're happy. And if they are not given, they are angry. This is a reference, 58 and 59. It is a reference to not the Battle of Tabuk, but rather the Battle of Hunain, which took place, which took place after Fatih Makkah. And this is the Bedouin leader who came up and he said, give me money. I'dil ya Muhammad. Remember that, the leader of the neo kharijites right? This is a reference to him. That there are those, and that was also Munafiq, because he outwardly says he's a Muslim. There were those who, if you give them the money, they're happy. And if they don't give the money, they are not happy. Rather, they should be happy at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has will them. Then, verse 60 is the primary verse in the Quran about the eight categories of zakah. And I've given a whole lecture here at MIC about these eight categories of zakah. These are the fiqh, the main, the main ayah in the Quran that delineates the eight categories of zakah. وَمِنْهُمُ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ النَّبِي Verse 61. There are those who harm the Prophet They irritate the Prophet And they say, huwa udhun. He listens to everything. He listens to everything. Udhun from ear. He listens to everything. So here we find they are making fun of the Prophet by for being too lenient. You're listening to all of the Sahaba and what they're basically saying, you're not listening to us. And they're also saying, you're listening to them when they accuse us. You're too lenient. You just listen to everybody. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reverses it back and says, قُلْ أُذُنُ خَيْرٍ لَكُمْ The fact that the Prophet only listens, it is better for you. Because if he were to act with you the way you deserve, you would not be alive anymore. It's better that he's only listening. قُلْ أُذُنُ خَيْرٍ لَكُمْ It is better that he's just listening to the complaints rather than acting upon them. So one of the points here being the Sahaba are complaining to you about us, the Munafiqun are saying. And you're just listening and you're believing them. And Allah Azza wa Jal says the fact that he's listening and not doing anything, it is better for you. That at least you are still in this uh, world. And he believes f uh, in Allah and he believes the believers. So the fact that he believes the Sahaba 
Allah praises this. He should believe them rather than uh, you. And he is a mercy for those who believe amongst you and those who irritate the Prophet ﷺ, for them is a painful torment. So we have clearly respect for Rasulullah ﷺ comes from Iman. And anybody who irritates the Prophet ﷺ, harms the Prophet ﷺ, who makes fun of the Prophet ﷺ, this person is not a Muslim. It is impossible for a Muslim to ridicule, mock, joke, put down, denigrate our Prophet ﷺ. And this is something that every Muslim realizes without knowing any evidence for. You just don't make fun of Rasulullah ﷺ because making fun of somebody means you don't respect that person. Just like we understand, you don't make fun of your mother and father. You don't joke about them. You don't say bad things about them because that is the height of disrespect. And how about Rasulullah Sallallahu who deserves a million times more than what our parents deserve? So here we have whoever irritates the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam shall have a painful uh, punishment. They swear by Allah to satisfy you. But Allah and His Messenger are more worthy that they be satisfied if you truly believe. Do, you not, do they not know that whoever opposes Allah and His Messenger, for him will be the fire of hell, and that will be a great disgrace? The hypocrites, now this we go back to the point of, the hypocrites at some level believe in Allah. The hypocrites are scared that a surah might be revealed about them, telling you what is in their hearts. Now imagine what type of iman is this then? That the hypocrites know Allah knows what's in their heart. And they're worried that a surah will come down. And the eloquence of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that fear which was in their hearts. And Allah azza wa jal describes their innermost thoughts and exposes them by exposing their fear of being exposed. This is a very profound ayah. If you get what I'm saying here, right? That they were scared of the ex expose and Allah Azza wa Jalla simply narrated their fear of the expose. And that was enough. That Allah is saying this is a, the reality of the hypocrites. Then if you were to ask them, what insultahum, they would say, we were only talking and playing. Say, is it about Allah and His ayat? Ayat here means signs, not verses, ayat. And His messenger that you are mocking and playing, don't make any excuse, you have committed kufr after your iman. Now what, what is this a reference to? We talked about this. These were the multiple jokes that are taking place on the way back from Tabuk, the multiple jokes that were taking place and this, these verses were revealed that you have committed kufr after your uh, iman. Uh, and then Allah Azza wa Jal threatens them uh, uh, describes them and threatens them. You can quickly read over yourselves. 67, 68, all the way down to uh, 74 as well. 74 as well. So there is an incident that some scholars say took place in Tabuk and others say took place in before Tabuk. And that is, and I did not actually mention it, and I guess I should have mentioned it as one possible incident of Tabuk. I'll mention it now. And that is that another claim that was said uh, on the way back from Tabuk was one of the hypocrites said, if Islam is true, if the process is correct, then this means that we are more misguided than donkeys. Some type of crude statement like this. That what a ridiculous faith. We must be as stupid as donkeys if this is true. And so when the news reached that this is what they said, they swore by Allah, no, we didn't say this. We swear we didn't say this. And so Allah revealed this verse, يَحْلِفُونَ بِاللَّهِ مَا قَالُوا They swear by Allah, they did not say it. وَلَقَدْ قَالُوا كَلِمَةُ الْكُفْرِ And they have said the kalimat al-kufr and وَكَفَرُوا بَعْدَ إِسْلَامِهِمْ And they have disbelieved after their Islam. وَهَمُّوا بِمَا لَمْ يَنَالُوا And they planned that which they could not attain. Now this is a reference according to most of the books of tafsir of the failed assassination attempt. Remember we talked about that, that 13 of them, 12 of them, they tried to assassinate. And here, وَهَمُّوا بِمَا لَمْ يَنَالُوا They attempted something but they could not reach it. وَهَمُّوا بِمَا لَمْ يَنَالُوا So this is a reference to that story that we uh, talked about. Verse number 75. 
there are those who make a promise to Allah that if you give us from his wealth, we will surely be from the most generous. But when Allah gives them, they become stingy and uh, they turn away. And therefore Allah has penalized them with hypocrisy in their hearts until the day of judgment. Now, this is famously attributed, this series of verses to one of the Sahaba. And the story is found in some of the books of hadith that he begged the Prophet to ask Allah for more money, more money, more money. And the Prophet kept on saying, don't, it's a fitna, do not ask for more money. But he insisted and he said, if I become rich, I will become generous. But then when he became rich, and when the, the zakat holders or the zakat collectors came, he was stingy, he made fun of them, he didn't want to give them, and he basically turned away. Now, the story is very famous and the Sahabi's name is mentioned, but the fact of the matter is that the story is problematic on many accounts. The most important one being that even in this story, the Sahabi apparently repents and the process and refuses to accept his repentance. And this is simply unheard of in the seerah and it goes against everything that the Quran itself teaches. If Allah can forgive shirk, then he can forgive stinginess and miserliness as well. So I'm not, that is why I skipped over the story. The story actually has a weakness in its chain. It's not an authentic uh, incident. And mostly when the seerah has incidents that are not authentic, not a problem. We gloss over them and narrate them. We narrate them, excuse me. But when the story contradicts something that is clearly authentic, then we should not narrate those stories. So this story about the Sahabi who allegedly became stingy and then Allah made him into a hypocrite. It's very commonly narrated. But it actually goes against explicit Qur'an. And that is that Allah says, whoever comes to me in forgiveness, I will forgive. And according to the story, the Sahabi came wanting to be forgiven. And the Prophet said, I will never forgive you. And Allah has revealed he's never going to forgive. So that doesn't make sense. And that is why we don't believe the story to be true. Not just because its chain is weak, because most of the seerah is chain is weak, it's not authentic, but because it contradicts a well-known principle. So then, what does this apply to? It doesn't apply to the Sahabi, it applies to some of the hypocrites. It applies to some of the hypocrites, not to the Sahabi. And there's a big difference between a hypocrite and a uh, Sahabi, that some of the hypocrites wanted to be rich, and they said, if we become rich, we will be generous. So when Allah gave them the riches, they turned out to be the stingiest of people. And so they never wanted to be generous. They were lying to Allah and His Messenger. And therefore Allah says, when you're lying to Allah and His Messenger, you will become a hypocrite. فَعَقَبَهُمْ nifaqan. So Allah resulted, Allah caused this to result in hypocrisy until the day that He uh, meets them. Verse number 79, the hypocrites are those who criticize the charity givers when they give the charity. And they criticize the one who has nothing to give other than his sweat and efforts. Remember the story? Remember the Sahabi who could not afford anything. So he spent the whole night drawing water from a well. And the next morning he came and he gave half, half a handful. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, one half I had to give to my wife and kids. And the other half is what I have. And the Munafiqun mocked and they said, This guy is only showing off. What does Allah need from half? A handful of dates. So this is الَّذِينَ يَلْمِزُونَ الْمُطَوْعِينَ فِي الصَّدَقَاتِ And then verse 80, we just talked about it. Seek forgiveness or don't seek forgiveness. If you were to seek 70 times forgiveness, Allah will not forgive. So this, we already talked about this. And this clearly, therefore, was the first verse revealed. And the Prophet ﷺ thought, I have the choice. Then, uh, verse 83, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that it is haram for the Prophet ﷺ to ever allow the hypocrites to go forth on jihad ever again. Now this is interesting because what battle took place after Tabuk? What battle took place after Tabuk? Tabuk was the last one. Yet verse number 83 says, hmm, it didn't actually take place. It was sent, but it didn't actually take place. So, the verse 83 is saying, you're never going to go forth in an expedition, even if you want to. And the fact of the matter is that there was no major expedition. Usama's one was a small expedition, a voluntary, it wasn't like Tabuk. So why then is Allah saying this? To humiliate them. That even if you want to go, Allah will not let you go. 
Even if you beg to go, you're not going to go. It's an honor and you will not get that honor. Then verse number 84. Do not pray over any of them who has died ever. So that's an ever. And never ask, stand for forgiveness because they have disbelieved in Allah and a and his uh, messenger. And then um, you can go on again. All of this is self-explanatory. Uh, 93 uh, is that the blame will be on those who sought permission for you and they were rich. They didn't have an excuse. 94, they make excuses when you come back. Now, this is a reference to the morning he came back from Tabuk. There was a long line of 85 people. Remember? This, this is where that comes. When you come back to them, they have a long line of excuses that say to them, so Allah revealed this verse after the process and accepted all of their excuses. Allah says, no, you tell them Allah will not accept their excuses. That Allah knows their uh, affairs and they will go back to the Alim Al-Ghayb and Allah will tell them what they have done. They only swear by Allah to you so that you will leave them alone. They just want to you to just don't worry about them. So Allah says, فَأَعْرِضُ عَنْهُمْ Then leave them alone. Why? إِنَّهُمْ رِجِسٌ They are rijus. They are filthy. And their place will be Jahannam because of what they have done. And then Allah mentions the uh, Bedouins. And that is because in the battle of Tabuk, if you remember, the bulk of the army came from outside of Medina. It was everybody in Medina and then also the bulk of the army outside of uh, Medina. And... Uh, Allah Azza criticizes that most of these outward converts, as of yet, Iman has not entered their hearts. And they are hypocrites. And this is also in the end of Surah Hujurat. And then Allah says, but not all of them. There are some good amongst them. And that is what Allah says in verse uh, 99. And then Allah praises the Muhajirun and the Ansar. That is verse 100. And then verse 102 uh, there are those who have mixed their good and their bad and they acknowledge their sins. Who are these people? These are the people who gave no excuse. They said we are wrong. These are the people they admitted we made a mistake. So Allah says they are those they admitted they're guilty. And they have some good deeds. There were Badris amongst them. There were people in Aqaba amongst them. They disobeyed you at Tabuk. They've mixed the two together. Allah might indeed forgive them, for Allah is Ghafurun Rahim. And then eventually, uh, verse 106, Allah Azza wa Jal tells them there will be those who their. Uh, Verdict will be delayed. So the, this is an implicit command to boycott them. وَآخَرُونَ مُرْجَوْنَ لِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ There are those, their verdict will be delayed. Whether Allah will punish or forgive, Allah knows what to do. So this was the implied commandment. You three, cut off. Allah will decide your fate. So this is verse 106. Okay, Verse 107 and 108 and 109 uh, and 110. All of this deals with the Masjid al-Dirar. We talked about this. So you can go and link it up to uh, the Masjid al-Dirar. Uh, and then uh, moving on to the hypocrites. Uh, 117 and 118. This is the announcement of Allah's accepting the repentance. And Allah begins by firstly praising the Muhajirun and Ansar. And this is an interesting point. That instead of saying they are forgiven, Allah begins by saying, Allah has already forgiven, before getting to those three, Allah has already forgiven the Muhajirun and the Ansar, all of those who followed the Prophet ﷺ, fi sa'atil usrati. This is the battle of Tabuk. Sa'atil usra. This is the battle of Tabuk. That after a party of them had almost inclined to doubt, uh, and then he forgave them, indeed Allah is forgiving and uh, merciful. And he also forgave the three. Wa'ala thalatha. And he forgave the three. So 
Allah praises the Muhajirun and Ansar that you are already forgiven, you obeyed. Then he says, and the rest of you, the three of you as well, you are also uh, forgiven. And then Allah concludes by talking about uh, those people who were not able to go, uh, those people who were not able to go, still they get the reward of those who went because they had the niyyah of uh, going. And then Allah concludes the surah. Uh, by reminding once again of the dangers of the hypocrites. They are worried about a surah being revealed. And then those two verses that conclude Surah At-Tawbah, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ That verily a messenger has come to you from amongst yourselves. He is one of you. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتْتُمْ He is pained by all that causes you harm. Something that troubles you, troubles him. حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ He is ever concerned for you and for the believers he is kind and merciful. And we see this even in the case of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul that he was grieved uh, at the possible punishment of Abdullah ibn Ubay and he was eager for him even though he died a hypocrite. And then the Prophet ﷺ is told that if they turn away then say حَسْبِ اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ All I need is Allah and he is sufficient for me. In him I put my trust and he is the Lord of the great throne. So we quickly went over Surah At-Tawbah and inshallah for those verses I didn't go over in this last two thirds. If you read them inshallah it will be self-explanatory. I don't think you need any uh, extra if you like to see it at this basic level and inshallah in a few weeks we'll come back to do the first actually third of Surah Tawbah because all of this is relevant to uh, the, uh, the, the incident of the Hajj. And by the way we are now close to the end of the Seerah. Uh, inshallah we might even finish um, 2014, maybe. Uh, we will finish 2014, or if not, then the beginning of 2015, inshallah ta'ala, we'll finish uh, the seerah. And then we need to start thinking about what will be uh, the next Wednesday class. From now, start thinking about that. Uh, but um, we are ready. Which month are we in now in the seerah? Which month are we in? Where are we now? Which year? Everybody should know the year. We're in the ninth year. We are now in Dhul Qa'idah. We're now in the Qaeda of the ninth year. And the next incident is going to be basically the Hajj of Abu Bakr, which is the, the Hajj before the Hajj of the Prophet. ﷺ. And then we just have one or two incidents and the year of delegations. And then uh, that's it. The, then we have the final few days of the process. ﷺ. The bulk of the Quran has already been revealed at this time. The laws of Islam have pretty much been finalized by this time. Uh, and uh, the conquests have now been solidified. And Mecca is now in you know, Islamic lands. And so the rest of Arabia will now be embracing Islam. One by one in this final year, every single tribe by and large embraced Islam because they realize now that Mecca is gone and Central Arabia is now one united power. The rest of the smaller tribes will not uh, fight Islam. And so they will embrace it one after the other. So we just have a few... Uh, Lessons left, inshallah ta'ala, and then uh, we come to an end of, mashallah, five years, really, of Sira classes, alhamdulillah. Uh, any... Yes, inshallah ta'ala. Any quick questions before we break for Salat al-Isha? You tell me, do you think she knows Arabic? She knows Arabic better than most of us in this room. That is the reality of <laughs> Mustashriqeen. They know things that most of us would not know. And she is still not a Muslim. And this is, I have met many people like this. Many people like this. There are many people out there. They appreciate certain things of Islam. But they just, they haven't invested emotionally in it. It's just an intellectual exercise. They appreciate it as an intellectual curiosity, but their qalb, their heart, has nothing to do with it. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, all you need to do is look at Iblis. But see, here's my point though, and this is, I know, surprising for many of you, but there are people out there, I have met them, I have studied with them, who by and large, in my estimation, interactions don't have an animosity to Islam, but they're just not attracted to it either. They are genuinely curious, and their curiosity is only from the mind, not from the heart. And so they live their lives 
agnostics. Most of these are agnostics. They don't have thought about the Akhirah and life and whatnot. But something happened in their lives that sparked an interest in the Middle East, in Arabic, in the Quran. And one thing led to another. They ended up doing a PhD. It's a good job for them. It's a prestigious job. And life goes on. And so, and here's, I know many of you will disagree with this, but not everybody who studies Islam and doesn't embrace it is an enemy to Islam. There are those who are sympathetic in their own way, but they just don't believe. And by the way, there are many who believe in their hearts but are too embarrassed to publicly say. And I have met a number of people like this, that they are believers secretly, but they fear. And now when I say believers, I mean linguistically. They haven't accepted the Shahada publicly. They don't pray, but they know Islam to be true. And it's like Abu Talib. It's like Abu Talib that it's too much of a peer pressure for him to give up his prestigious acceptance in society, right? Lifestyle and whatnot. And, and then people will make fun of him because yes, let's be honest here. Can you imagine, you know, somebody who has a reputation and a degree and whatnot, and then he embraces Islam. People are going to ridicule him. This is especially in the world that we live in. So there are people like that. I have met them. So my point being that obviously for the most Muslims, they really, it's interesting to hear Angelica Nero, but they don't need to read her works. No need for that. I mean, you can trust the Muslim scholarship. But for those who are in academia, we need to distinguish between those who are genuinely haters of Islam. And there are people like that. You know, Bernard Lewis, for example, is a classic example. The classic example, you know, a neocon person who really despises Islam. And he says things about Muslims and Islam that shows the hatred that he has. And then versus those who are genuinely sympathetic and feel some type of rapport with the Muslims, even though they're not Muslims, right? There are people like that as well. There are many people like that, that for some reason, they just don't want to embrace, but their minds... You know, they have قُلْ إِنَّ الْهُدَى هُدَى اللَّهِ Right? إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ Right, this is the real... And again, I have met many people like this. Yes? In the story of the people who you mentioned at the same battle, when you talk about all the events leading up to the treaty, all the characters, the messenger, and then we talk about them coming back. At what point did they say, okay, there's no army coming, we just turn around and go back? After 20 days. After... We will assume that the Prophet was given permission to go back. It's not explicitly mentioned, but we'll assume this because he never did anything without permission. So it is an assumption we make that after 20 days, Jibreel allowed or told him it's time to go back. Okay, it's not anything explicit in the text. Yes. There's not much mentioned about the maternal relatives of the Prophet There's not much mention about his immediate family, believe it or not. So, Arab society in general, and Islam as well, kind of conceals the feminine side. So, like, one of the things we're going to do as soon as I finish the seerah, inshallah ta'ala, the first four or five lectures after that will be the family of the Prophet We'll do that. Believe it or not, there's not, don't get too excited, there's not that much. We don't know much about Zainab and Umm Kuthum and, and, and Fatima and Ruqayya, we don't know much. Very little, to be honest. Why? Because who interacted with them to tell us? Right? Where are the, the public in it? So there's only a handful of things that we know. So it's not surprising that we don't know much about the maternal relatives of the process. And we don't know much about his own daughters. So, so I can look that information up for you. That information, we can look it up. Um, the maternal uncles, we can look up. That should not be a problem. But that is a good question. Uh, where are his cousins from that side? That I will find that out for you. What are his cousins' names from that side? And did they play a role in the seerah or not? I'll find that out for you. That is a uh, possibility to look up, inshallah. Final question, yes? Like, uh, 
We can't say that fully, but. So he's saying, can we say that Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul submitted to Allah but not to the Prophet? We cannot say that. Uh, maybe there's an element of truth there, but one thing for sure submitting to the Prophet is a necessary requirement to submit to Allah. Only by obeying the Prophet will you be guided. So obedience to and allegiance to the Prophet is necessary for Iman. You cannot have Iman without Iman in Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is why, even though we say La ilaha al Muhammad Rasulullah, in actual fact, Muhammad Rasulullah must occur before La ilaha illallah. Think about it. How do you know La ilaha illallah except through Muhammad Rasulullah? So in way of actually belief, you first believe the Prophet is a Prophet, then you believe in Allah and the Quran. Right? So for us, belief in the Prophet Sallallahu is a necessary it's an integral part of iman without it there is no iman and that's why allah swears by your lord ya rasulullah fala wa rabbika la yu'minun allah swears by your lord rabbika la yu'minun they have no iman hatta yuhakkimuka fi ma shajara bainahum until they make you the ultimate judge in every single thing that happens to them and and then they find nothing in their heart to listen to you. And they submit. There's an emphasis, right? This is Maf'ul uh, Mutlaq, right? They have an emphasis. And they submit a complete submission. So Taslim, Islam, is even to the Messenger. Because we only know Islam through the Messenger, right? So even if there's an element of truth here, Anybody who rejects the messenger has rejected the message and the one who sent the message and cannot be a Muslim. And that's a very central point of our religion, of Islam. Inshallah with that.